Well, here we are in chapter 46 of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, we're getting back into the main timeline. If you remember, last chapter was kind of a look back, kind of going to the past chapter. So now we're back up into the present day with Jeremiah and these people. Uh, and so just as a quick refresher, uh, if you haven't watched the previous videos or if it's been a while, just realize Jerusalem's been destroyed. The, the Babylon destruction has happened. The people have left because the governor that Babylon appointed over Jerusalem was assassinated. Then they were taken hostage and they, they fled and they got captured. Now the people are panicking and they said, oh, Jeremiah, pray to God. Tell him what we need to do. Ask him what we need to do, basically, and we'll do whatever he says. And he, So he prays. Jeremiah says, okay, we need to stay here. Don't go to Egypt. And they went, well, you know, we were kind of hoping to go to Egypt. We were hoping God had let us. So we're going to claim you're a false prophet to make our, our conscience feel better. And we're all going to go to Egypt. So they went to Egypt and he prophesied, if you go to Egypt, you will die by the very things you're afraid of running into in Jerusalem area. So we're kind of caught up to that time. So the people have gone to Egypt. Now here in chapter 46, this is a prophecy against not just the Jews in Egypt, but against Egypt itself. So there's a few prophecies that Jeremiah is given about the people that were the neighbors of, of Judah and the, the uh, Palestine area, basically. So this one's about Egypt in this one. So let's learn what Jeremiah has to say about this. So verse 1, the word of the Lord, which came to Jeremiah, uh, the prophet against the Gentiles, against Egypt, against the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt. So Gentiles kind of meaning everybody who's non part of Israel, then Egypt, and then the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt. So he's kind of narrowing it down, going from broad to narrow, uh, which was by the river Euphrates in Carchemish, which Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, smote in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. So what he's talking about in, in two, in chapter two, or chapter two, sorry, verse two is the battle of Carchemish. This is a battle. You can go look it up. You can Google it. It's, I'm sure it's on Wikipedia. You can read more about it there. I've done all that. So I'm going to read you some stuff about it. So you don't have to go do that yourself if you don't want to, but if you want to verify it, you are welcome to go do that. So the battle of Carchemish was around 605 BC. So that's around the fourth year of Jehoiakim as the king of Israel. Okay, so during most of the second millennium, Egypt controlled the area of Syria, Palestine, but she lost undisputed control after the collapse of the 19th dynasty and never regained it. So since about 1200 BC and on, Egypt's not been a world power. Uh, and although she made an incursion into the area under Pharaoh Shishak, it's 1 Kings chapter 14, just before 900 BC, and was involved in intrigues and even launched attacks in the days of the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Persians who controlled the area in turn. In 609 BC, Pharaoh Necho II, who had succeeded his father Semeticus, marched forth to assist the Assyrians. Now that might sound strange. You might say, but weren't they uh, enemies of the Assyrians? Yes, they were. But you have to understand, as Babylon marched through and destroyed Assyria, as much as Egypt hated Assyria, they hated Babylon even worse. So the enemy of my enemy becomes my friend. Babylonians, the bigger enemy. So Egypt actually tries to help Assyria survive when Babylon conquers Assyria, basically. That's this battle of Carchemish. Uh, so let's see the assaults. Uh, oh, sorry. So they marched forth to assist the Assyrians now in their last throes to recapture Haran. The assault on Haran felled, but Necho remained in the area with the, a center at Carchemish. This is the modern Jerablus in the upper western Euphrates. When the Babylonian armies were ready, however, they launched an all-out attack on Carchemish and sent the Egyptian forces fleeing headlong. The words of the poem, verses 3 through 12, were composed either just before or just after Nebuchadrezzar had humiliated the Egyptians. That was Thompson in his book, uh, the book of Jeremiah. So what we're going to read here is a poem about the battle of Carchemish. 
that happened. So the Carchemish, if I remember correctly, was is north of Palestine, northern end of Palestine, up closer to where Assyria would be. So Egypt moved their forces up the coast, probably by boats, maybe by land up the coast, past Israel area, up into the north area to fight Babylon and try to provide assistance to Assyria. Because Babylon, when they marched, they marched from the east to the west and basically shrunk Assyria down to about Nineveh was their capital. And then from Nineveh, it went to another place on the coast. And then it kind of, that was kind of the end, basically, at that point. Um, so this is where Egypt is trying to help Assyria fight Babylon. Uh, so that just, that gives you the history and the time frame of what's happening. So let's get into this poem uh, that Jeremiah is giving us. Verse 3, Order ye the buckler and shield, and draw near to battle. Harness the horses, and get up, ye horsemen, and stand forth with your helmets, furbish the spears, and put on the brigadines. Now, brigadines in verse 4 was a coat of mail armor, chain mail, basically, uh, usually made of overlapping metal scale. So, so well, mail armor is more like plate type armor. Chain mail is where you have those interlocking rings. So it, it gives you armor, but it's very, very flexible. So what this is saying is not so much the chain mail, but this is more of a like scales on a fish, a scale mail. So these are small. Instead of, instead of you know, when we think of knights, we think of large plates of armor, like the big chest plate, was one big piece of armor. The back plate was one big piece of armor. They put one piece of armor on their upper arm, one piece of armor on their lower arm. This, what we're talking about here is scale mail. And what that is, is lots of small pieces of armor that looks like, kind of like fish scales. So it gives you the armor, but allows for more flexibility in the movement for the soldier. So that's what brigadines is, means here in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, so verse 5, Wherefore, have I seen them dismayed and turned away back? And their mighty ones are beaten down and are fled apace and look not back, for fear was round about, saith the Lord. So the Egyptians are ready for war, basically. Uh, but when they, when, again, when Babylon hit them at Carchemish, they were not ready for Babylon. They, they realized that Babylon's way better prepared. It's just a whole different formidable foe, and they were not ready for it, and so they had to get out of there. So verse 6, Let not the swift flee away, nor the mighty man escape. They shall stumble and fall toward the north by the river Euphrates. Who is this that cometh up as a flood, whose waters are moved as the rivers? Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers, as, and he saith, I will go up and will cover the earth, and I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Now, this is interesting that he's equating Egypt to a flood. Okay, now in the summer, the Nile would flood. There's three seasons in, in traditional Egyptian weather. There's the inundation season, which is the flood, the Nile floods basically and it, it brings a layer of nutrient dense uh, silt, silt to the soil which improves your crops basically it's fertilizing the ground and so the crops grow really well so that's the inundation period and then they have the uh, after inundation then you have your planting period and then you have your harvest period basically and then you get ready for the next inundation period so that's kind of the three common seasons um, so this is what would happen. So now Egypt is trying to be like a flood. They're just trying to just flood out and take over. Uh, and we've seen earlier in the book of Jeremiah that Babylon was also referenced as a flood. Their army would just come up over the hills down into the area where Jerusalem was like a flood of water coming over the mountains, basically. So Egypt and Babylon are coming together almost like two great floods clashing. And so Egypt's trying to flood the land, trying to get up there with their armies to help. Uh, verse 9, Come up, ye horses, and rage, ye chariots, and let the mighty men come forth. So these are mercenaries that Egypt hired, basically, to help supplement their army 
to uh, so kind of the special forces hired hired guns type of idea. Uh, the Ethiopians and the Libyans. So this is Cush, also Ethiopians, the land of Cush. Uh, Libyans and that handle the shield, and the Lydians that handle and bend the bow. So Lydian, Libyans are probably the uh, punt of Egypt. If you hear the word punt, people of punt uh, in Egyptian literature, and they lay along the east coast of Africa, basically in the regions. Uh, Somaliland today. So in the Somalia area, that's where these people would come from, basically. Uh, alternately, it was a part of Libya at one point. Uh, Lydian, so a D instead of a B, Lydians, uh, they usually come from a place called Lud. So if you see Lud as a, in uh, ancient writings, the, the land of Lud, that's the Lydians. Um, some regard Lud as Lydia in Asia Minor, referred to in Isaiah 66, along with Javan, which is Greece, and the coastal islands. Uh, in that passage, Lydians are associated with the Egyptian army. Semeticus I was given help by Gyges, king of Lydia, to resist Ashurbanipal's domination. So that's when Assyria was conquering everybody. Uh, alternately, Lud refers to a land in North Africa. That's Genesis 10. Uh, another proposal is to read Lydians as in Nahum 3, where Put and the Libyans are allied with Cush and Egypt in a losing cause. That's, that's the Battle of Carchemish. Same, same thing, just a different prophet talking about it. So that's where these people, they handle and bend the bow. So they're archers. They have shields. These are formidable foes. So you want, these are the hired thugs, the hired special operations guys to be a part of your army to help in fighting the Babylonians. Uh, now verse 10, For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the sword shall devour, and it shall satiate and made shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. So when we think about this, there's a couple things I like about verse 10. They're good to point out, okay? Uh, it's interesting to think of this battle as a sacrifice, okay? Um, using the Egyptian defeat as kind of a metaphorical sacrificial feast, if you will. This is, in a way, Babylon defeating Egypt was God's way of, of basically using Egypt as a sacrifice, basically, kind of like in, in, in a sacrifice to say Egypt needed to atone for their wickedness and sins, and this was a way of offering a sacrifice to God. Uh, that's one way you could look at this. So it, this, is, this is interesting to think about because this is not a righteous army of God avenging God for in behalf of God, basically. This isn't like the Crusades, where we believe there, there was the people that believed that they were, they were acting in the name of God to defeat and destroy the, the Mongol hordes or the, the, uh, uh, the followers of Islam, the Muslims, and things like that. That's, that. The Crusades were people who believed that God wanted them to kill other people. They were the righteous army. The other army was the wicked army. We've got to go back and take the Holy Land back. Because we are the righteous, they're the wicked. Uh, and the problem is, is the Christians and the Jews believe that. The Muslims believe the same thing. They were the righteous, and the Christians and the Jews were the wicked. And that's why we have the contention in the Middle East today, as far as religions go. There's still a lot of other contentions there, too. Uh, this is the problem. Okay, That's still a gospel of prosperity mentality. God, as he shows in verse 10, does not form a righteous army to avenge himself. He uses other wicked armies to destroy the wicked. The wicked destroy the wicked. That's a very important point to, that we need to make here is understand that. So this goes into the last days. If people want you to believe that they are forming a righteous army for God, it's baloney. That is a lie. God will handle the battles himself or he will use wickedness 
to destroy other wickedness. He, he's not going to make the righteous stoop to a lower level to defeat the wicked. He'll just let the wicked kill themselves, kill each other, and let, leave the righteous righteous. This is important. Very important point to think about. Okay, and that's another thing to think about with this verse 10. Uh, now, verse 11, go up un, into Gilead and take balm, O virgin, the daughter of Egypt. In vain shalt thou use many medicines, for thou shalt not be cured. So this is, in a way, talking about Egypt trying to heal from these wounds. They've lost a lot of soldiers, a lot of wounded soldiers, wounded national pride, basically, as, as Babylon just marches over them like they're nothing. So Egypt is trying to recuperate from the loss at Carchemish. And I, Jeremiah is saying, this isn't going to work out. Uh, now, when, when we started this chapter, we talked about how uh, this is a poem about the Battle of Carchemish. It was probably written either shortly before the battle or shortly after the battle. So scholars look at this from two perspectives. This could be Jeremiah writing a poem about what did happen. But the problem is, is this chapter starts with a prophecy from God. So most likely, this is God prophesying what is about to happen. Okay. Modern scholarship eliminates the idea of revelation, God intervening and revealing things. Because if you allow God to intervene and reveal things, then anything is possible. It's, it's hard to objectively evaluate the will of God. So they cut that out and say, how could this be possible if we rule out God's intervention? So that would mean it would have to have been written after it happened. So that's more of a logical, human logical way to think about it. So, but this is, if you believe in God and he can reveal things to his prophets, like Amos 3, 7 talks about, then there's a good chance this was revealed before it happened. Basically, it's a revelation. Uh, so verse 11, or verse 12, excuse me, let's continue on. The nations have heard of thy shame and thy cry hath filled the land. So it's this is a famous battle. People have heard about the loss of Egypt in this battle. For the mighty man has stumbled against the mighty, and they are fallen both together. So everybody, all the all the national neighbors in the area heard of Egypt's demise, the Battle of Carchemish. Verse 13, the word that the Lord spake to Jeremiah the prophet, now Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, should come and smite the land of Egypt. So this is in August 605 BC. We talked about this. Nabopolassar is the father of Nebuchadrezzar. Okay, now he died, and his son had to hurry back to Babylon to be anointed the king, basically, and take over the throne. However, the Babylonian advance on Egypt was soon resumed, and by the end of 604 BC, the Babylonian army captured and sacked Ascalon with Nebuchadrezzar's forces pressing on toward Egypt. So Jeremiah composed the oracle in verses 14 through 24. So this is, this is in a way, we could look at this and say this is just one large prophecy from Jeremiah. Uh, but just like I said in verse 13, this is the word of the Lord that spake to Jeremiah. So it could be that this whole prophecy came in chunks to Jeremiah. So we've just read the first chunk. Now we're into the second chunk, the second part of this. Sometimes God does that. Sometimes he doesn't reveal everything to you at once. He reveals this piece, and then he reveals this piece, and then he reveals this piece. And so that's, we could see that as a possibility in this chapter. So verse 14, as we get into this, in a way, a second revelation about Egypt and Babylon. Uh, Declare ye in Egypt, and publish in Migdal, and publish in Noph, and in Tephanes. Say ye, stand fast and prepare thee, for the sword shall devour round about thee. Now let's talk about these places for a second here. Migdal means tower, okay? Uh, it is known in the Tel El Amarna tablets from the 14th century, which is another ancient writing, the Amarna tablets, uh, as Magdali. It is mentioned again in the days of Exodus, Exodus 14, Numbers 33. 
and also in Ezekiel's time, Ezekiel 29. Uh, the name is Semitic, probably borrowed by the Egyptians from the Canaanites. We do not know whether all these texts refer to the same place, but they probably do. The place was located in the east of the Delta region, probably in the same general area as Taphanes. The exact site is unknown. Tel El Hur midway between Pelusium and Sele has been suggested. Noph, a variant form of Moth, is the Hebrew name for Memphis, the chief city of Lower Egypt. It was situated some 13 miles south of modern Cairo. Uh, Pathros was the name of Upper Egypt, literally the land of the south. So that's, we're going through these different cities here. Uh, let's see, I just lost my spot. There it is. Okay, the expression land of Pathros suggests a region. It is now known that a sizable Jewish community was established at Elephantine, an island on the Nile in southern Egypt. So that's Upper Egypt. Egypt, basically. Uh, that's where the Nag Hammadi Library comes from, in fact. Let's see. During the 5th centuries, when they were there, important uh, Aramaic documents left by them have provided valuable information about their society. How early this colony was founded is not known, but to judge from Jeremiah 44, it was there already just after the fall of Jerusalem in 587 BC. So these places are Migdal, Nof, Taphanes. These are places in and around the country of Egypt basically. Uh, verse 15, why are thy valiant men swept away? They stood not because the Lord did drive them. So this is interesting because Jeremiah is now telling us that God was in control of the battle at Carchemish and that as the Egyptians fled and Babylon pursued them, the Egyptians could not stop them. And it wasn't because Babylon was some amazing superpower. It was because God was in support of Babylon. God was using Babylon to destroy other wicked nations. And so that's what God is playing a role in this, basically. Uh, verse 16, He made many to fall, yea, one fell upon another. And they said, Arise, let us go again to our own people and to the land of our nativity from the oppressing sword. So this is them basically in retreat. They want to get out of there. They don't want to deal with this. Babylon's just wiping them out. Verse 17, they did cry there, Pharaoh king of Egypt is but a noise. He hath passed the time appointed. So what they're saying in verse 17 is, is like a modern equivalent of that would basically be saying, you know, Pharaoh talks a good game, but he can't produce on the court. That's kind of what they're saying there is Pharaoh king of Egypt is but a noise. He's kind of past his useful, usefulness. He makes it sound like we're a formidable army, but in reality, we're not. We're, it's not, he's hawking us up, but we're, we can't perform. Uh, verse 18, as I live, saith the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts, surely as Tabor is among the mountains and as Carmel by the sea, so shall he come. So when we look at verse 18, we can see now Tabor is a mountain, Mount Tabor. Uh, that rises some 1,800 feet as an isolated mountain in the plain of Jezreel in northern Israel. It creates the impression of considerable height with its steep slopes, and it's certainly a striking landmark over a wide area. It's a, it, you can see it from a long ways away, apparently. So a big mountain, uh, just as surely as Tabor is a mountain, and as surely as Carmel is by the sea, so Mount Carmel is another mountain, but it is down by the sea, which raises at its maximum height some 1,700 feet, and at its western edge falls away sharply to the Mediterranean Sea. So it's a mountain right next to the Mediterranean, basically. Um, it was the scene of Elijah's contest with the prophets of Baal. Both seemed to Jeremiah to depict Nebuchadrezzar, who towered over Egypt in his might, like lofty mountains towering over a plain. So realize this is all poetry, and I'm sure if we read it in Hebrew, it would probably actually make more sense. It seems Hebrew poetry sounds clumsy in Egypt, or in English, excuse me. Uh, so it doesn't sound like poetry we would think of, but in Hebrew it sounds a lot better. Uh, so this is relating metaphorically these two large mountains 
and how they are kind of powering, standing over everybody else, basically, just like Babylon is over everybody else. So verse 19, uh, O thou daughter dwelling in Egypt, furnish thyself to go into captivity. So that's basically Egypt, be prepared to be, to surrender to, to Babylon. For Noph shall be waste and desolate without inhabitants. Now, No is a name for Jupiter City or Thebes. So they could, Noph could be a reference to Thebes. Basically, Egypt is described as a fair heifer, but destruction would come from to her from the north, which is Babylon, coming down to her, basically. Now, uh, verse 20, like it says here, Egypt is like a very fair heifer, but destruction cometh, it cometh out of the north. So that's literally what verse 20 says, what we just mentioned. Verse 21, also her hired men, so these are the these are the mercenaries, the people from, from Somalia and the other places that they brought up to supplement their army with. They are in the midst of her like fatted bullocks, for they also are turned back and are fled away together. They did not stand because the day of their calamity was come upon them in the time of their visitation. So even, even the hired thugs, as good as they are, aren't standing a chance in this battle against Babylon. Why is that? Because, as we read earlier, God is in control of this. God wants Babylon to win. So God is influencing things to make it hard for Egypt to win and easy for them to lose. Verse 22, The voice thereof shall go like a serpent, for they shall march with an army and come against her with axes and hewers of wood. So these are basically, they're cutting they're cutting the forest down. They're, they're taking out the trees as they march. In fact, verse 23, it says, They shall cut down her forest, saith the Lord, though it cannot be searched, because they are more than the grasshoppers and are innumerable. Uh, so this is, if you think about it, this is a just an innumerable army, and as they march, they're taking the forest down as they go, basically. Uh, this was not an uncommon tactic. In fact, when when an army would win, uh, like Assyria, this was a very common Assyrian thing, Assyria would come down, take over an area, and then chop all the trees down around the place. They would literally destroy the agriculture so that you lost resources in that area and were dependent upon Assyria more for your supplies and for things, basically. Uh, that This is a common Assyrian tactic. Uh, verse 24, the daughter of Egypt shall be confounded. Uh, another translation of that word confounded is exposed. Okay, Egypt will be like an exposed woman to an invading army. So she shall be delivered to the hand of the people of the north, basically. So what happens to a woman? To women in when an invading army comes in? Unfortunately, a lot of bad things often happen. Uh, because they tended to, again, look at women not as humans, but as property. And so a conquering male army would see the enemy's women as objects and as property and as a way of conquering. And back then, they didn't have a concept back then of, of uh, you know, rape or sexual abuse. That wasn't a thing back then. So uh, sex was more of a way of proving who was dominant and who was who was the leader and who was the follower, basically. So an invading army coming in, taking the enemy's women and having sex with them, even forcibly, is a way of telling the people, sending a message to people, you are in subjection to us, basically, is kind of an, uh, a way of getting that, conveying that message in the ancient world, basically. So it's a diff different way to think about these things. We think very differently today about these concepts than they did back then, basically. And that's part of that challenge uh, in understanding these. Now, verse 25, it says, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saith. So this is the third time we've seen this. This could be a third part of that revelation, basically, a third time. Behold, I will punish the multitude of no, which what we talked about earlier is another word for naf, which can mean Thebes, which used to be a capital of Egypt. 
Uh, and Pharaoh and Egypt with their gods and their kings, even Pharaoh and all them that trust in him. And I will deliver them into the hand of those that seek their lives and into the hand of Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of his servants. And afterward it shall be inhabited as in the days of old, saith the Lord. But fear not thou, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save thee from afar off and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and be in rest and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. Fear not thou, fear thou not, excuse me, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee, for I will make a full end of all the nations whither I have driven thee. But I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure, yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished. So, uh, now it, it's interesting when we think about this, because this means if Babylon makes it to Thebes, this is the uh, an ancient capital of Israel, more of uh, the southern kingdom, the upper kingdom, basically. Uh, but that means they've made it through the northern kingdom, down into the southern kingdom. They've, they've really made it far. Uh, from an archaeological standpoint, from what I understand, we don't have evidence that that happened, that Babylon marched through and captured Thebes and all of Egypt. We, there could be evidence there. Maybe they captured it. They, they just conquered them back to that point and then left. We don't know. Um, but we just can't prove it archaeologically that it did happen this way. Uh, but realize, too, at the end of this, that even though this was a prophecy against Egypt, that God is reminding his people, Jacob or Israel, that uh, they, he will preserve a part of them and help them to come back to him in the future, basically. Uh, so let's jump over to the next chapter as we look at the next revelation against another neighbor of Judah, basically.